Good evening. Welcome everybody to tonight's book talk. My name is Miriam Zadl. I am the director of the Munich Documentation Center for the History of National Socialism, and I welcome you all very warmly to our online event. Since 2019, it's been more than four years already, and I'm most happy about it. Our center, the Munich Documentation Center for the History of National Socialism, together with the Bavarian American Academy, and the America House in Munich have been organizing a joint series of lectures, talks, discussions, um, and book launches in which we take a look at the transatlantic relations between the US and Europe, as well as the historical and current developments on either side of the Atlantic. With our previous guests, such as Ibram Kendi, Susan Neyman, Carolyn Randall uh, Williams, or Vietan Nguyen, we discussed, among others, topics such as racism, migration, war, women's rights and feminism, ethno-nationalism, anti-Semitism, and, of course, memory. Today, I'm most thrilled to welcome Linda Kinster and Andrew Gross, who will be talking about and discussing Linda's new book, Come to this Court and Cry, How the Holocaust Ends published by Bloomsbury in May 2023, a probing and profound study about the nature of memory and justice at a time when revisionism, ultranationalism, and denialism make it feel like history is slipping out from under our feet. Linda Kinsler's book focuses on the question of how history can become distorted over time, how easily the innocent are forgotten, and how carelessly the, guilt, the guilty are sometimes reprieved. Now let me welcome as chair and moderator of tonight's talk, Professor Andrew Gross, who has been teaching at the Georg August University of Göttingen as a professor of North American studies. He holds a PhD in American literature and critical theory from the University of California. In 2012, he completed his habilitation at the JFK Institute of the Freie University in Berlin. He's also co-editor of the European Journal of American Studies and the American Studies Journal. Before I hand over to Andrew, I also want to thank Christoph Staub of the Bavarian America Academy, the America House, and my colleagues, Ilo Holzmeier and Jonas Peter, who the three of them have been organizing this event very beautifully and enthusiastically. Um, I'm most happy that Linda is joining us tonight, and I wish you and us all an exciting and interesting evening. And I'll hand over to you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miriam, for that kind introduction. Uh, perhaps the best way to introduce Linda Kinsler is to turn to a passage in the book we'll be discussing this evening, Come to This Court and Cry where she distills her life into a few bullet points for somebody who wants to get to know her before sharing information with her. She tells him that both of her parents are from Riga, that her mother is Jewish and her father is not, and that in the process of learning about her own family story, she found herself intimately involved in Latvian memory politics. Before turning our attention to that story or to those two intertwined stories, I want to point out that Linda reports on European politics for several major publications. She is executive editor of the Dial Magazine, contributing writer for The Economist's 1843 magazine and for Jewish Currents. Her work appears in The New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, and Wired Magazine. She helped launch Politico Europe in Brussels and has covered the war in Ukraine for the New Republic. It quickly becomes evident to anyone reading this book that Linda is a journalist as well as a scholar. This year, she received her PhD from the Department of Rhetoric at UC Berkeley. Her dissertation is a history of legal oblivion of instances of prescribed forgetting in the aftermath of war and revolution. It is perhaps no accident that one thesis explored in Come to This Court and Cry is that the opposite of forgetting is not remembering, but justice. The book, as I said, is a braided narrative that brings together two stories. First, the author's search for the truth about her grandfather, 
And second, the attempts of some Latvians to rehabilitate the memory of Hu Herbert Circus. Did I get the pronunciation right, Linda? <laughs> Been working yes. on that. Uh, to, to transform a, a man who was once known as the Latvian Lindbergh for his um, piloting feats in the 1930s, and then was known as the butcher or the hangman of Latvia for his brutal role in the Holocaust to transform him into a national hero. The stories of her grandfather and of Circus uh, intersect in Latvia during World War II, when both men served in the notorious Areas Commando, responsible for the brutal murder at close range of thousands upon thousands of innocent Jews. They also intersect today, for instance, in the pages of a Latvian spy thriller called You Will Never Kill Him, that puts Boris Kinsler, Linda's grandfather, behind a secret Soviet commando that kills Circus in Uruguay. This is fiction. <laughs> the actual story is more complicated and more strange. Circus was killed by the Mossad a few years after the Eichmann trial in an act of extra legal justice. This may have had the unintended effect of turning him into a hero for nationalists a few decades later, when the attorney responsible for clearing Kukurs's name tells Linda Kinsler she should look into the fictional novel to find out facts about her grandfather, she finds herself trapped in a literary twilight zone where the line between fact and fiction begins to blur. Thus, Kinsler's book is also a reflection on the relation of literature to historical evidence and ultimately to the law. The book is a page turner. You really have to read it. It reads like a spy thriller, but it is also a counter thriller that insists on the incomplete nature of historical memory rather than on making up stories to fill in the blanks. Here it bears remembering that genocide creates a crisis of witnessing that only increases as time goes by. Genocide begins by marking some people as different and it ends by denying that anybody killed them. Come to this court and cry is a sustained reflection in the form of a personal narrative about what remembering means to an individual, a family, to different ethnic groups and to a nation. It is a book about justice. Linda and I will chat for about 45 minutes now, and the last 10 minutes will be open to questions from the audience. So Linda, can I ask you, um, this is your first book, I think. Can I ask you, what got you interested in this story? How did it all start? Well, um, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Miriam, for those really kind introductions. Uh, it means the world to me to be read with so much care um, and attention uh, and to hear the project described as kind of engaging in a literary twilight zone uh, is such an apt description because truly there were many times over the course of working on this project where I struggled to find my bearings between fact and fiction and law and memory and history. Um, and so the book is really my effort to find my own coordinates in this ongoing debate. Um, and the second thing I want to say before we kind of jump in is that, you know, this talk is about the dimensions of Holocaust memory and how um, what the, the afterlives of atrocities look like by the people who survive them and by those who then seek to prove them. And I just want to acknowledge that we are in a moment where atrocities are being committed left and right and where the memory of the Holocaust is being invoked. And I think that's something that I am very much keeping front of mind uh, in this discussion and uh, in my life right now. Um, but to the question about, you know, why I wrote this book and how I undertook this project, I really didn't feel like I had a choice. I, and it's not just because of my own family history. I think one thing that I have been um, interested to hear is that, you know, some people read this as only a family story in the guise of, you know, many other um, kind of Holocaust histories. But for me, it was really when I found out that there was an ongoing posthumous criminal investigation into Herbert Zuckers, who, as you said, was murdered by Mossad in 1965 as an effort of achieving vengeance uh, for the crimes that he had committed during the Holocaust. 
And I was shocked, honestly, to discover that this dead man could still be the subject of a criminal investigation and indeed wanted to know what was being investigated, you know, what could have been the subject and what could have been the aim. And so I was, it was really as a, I felt an obligation because I had been studying Jewish memory and history to, first of all, understand what was going on and also try to intervene to try to do what I could in the, with the tools I have available to me, which is writing and reporting to prevent whatever rehabilitation of his memory was ongoing from proceeding. Uh, and that required speaking to the prosecutor, speaking to the Jewish attorneys and to the Jewish community of Riga who were also involved and to collecting my own evidence in the case. And that's what you have in the book. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, I think the way you put it is that a ghost is in the docket. There's a ghost <laughs> standing trial, right? Yeah. And that was, you know, everyone was very forthcoming about the strange dimensions of this case, right? That it could only theoretically proceed to trial. But in a case like this, it doesn't matter if there's a trial because it was already taking up space in public opinion. It was very much an investigation that was being followed in the public eye in Latvia um, that other nations were being made aware of, you know, that um, Israel and the UK and Germany and Brazil and Uruguay had all been asked to submit their own evidence from their state police files for this investigation. And so, you know, this is when we get to thinking about what we expect law to do. Do we expect it to provide us with a clear answer? And indeed, why after all these years is this still the place that we are looking for justice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this conversation is going to take us all over the world into many complicated uh, conversa topics. But before, I'd like to follow kind of the personal thread uh, to get us there, because the book begins in a very personal way with a conversation with your father, I think, and it ends in a, in a very personal and revealing way. Um, and somewhere in the middle, you talk about how you were a journalist, you were acting as a journalist for most of the most of it. But at a certain point, you felt like you were an actor in this history, mm -hmm. like you had a had a had a more active role to play. Um, could you tell a little, talk a little bit about what gets you into the story in the first place? I mean, I, I, what I'm asking about is your grandfather. And I guess I'm, I'm wondering how big a role did the, your grandfather or the memory of your grandfather play in your life as a child? And when did his memory become important? Yeah, well, I my paternal grandfather disappeared um, in 1949, even before my father was born. Um, when he never got a chance to meet his own father. And, you know, the fact of this disappearance uh, loomed large, certainly over his entire life, but also um, later over mine. And, you know, growing up, I really didn't think too much about it because I had my other Jewish grandfather in my life. And I knew his story of fighting for the Soviet army and of surviving and of the, that the Jewish side of the family's journey from first Ukraine and then to Riga and then to the United States. Um, but I was aware that this other grandfather had existed and that there was some kind of lack of clarity about what had happened to him. You know, the official story that Soviet authorities gave was that he uh, killed himself in Silame on the coast of Estonia, which at the time was a closed Soviet city where they were mining uranium. And so it wasn't a casual place you could be. You had to have a pass to go in and out and, you know, um, it, that immediately kind of raised suspicions about the circumstances of his death. Um, and it was really only much, much later when I was starting out to be a journalist in my own right, you know, and kind of looking for stories and also being curious about my own family history as one is when one's young, that I started thinking about this as a story that needed to be probed further. And it actually also happened that around that time, because Latvia was still a newly independent nation that some of the archives that had previously been hidden by Soviet authorities, such as the KGB identification cards, you know, they're, when the Soviets fled Riga, they left in the basement of what is called the KGB corner house, literal bags, uh, you know, little index cards. And on each index card was the name of an agent, 
who had worked for the KGB and their alias and their dates of reporting, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's one of the ways that we found out that my grandfather had indeed worked for the KGB after he had been a member of the RIS commando. And so it kind of opened up this web of questions um, that I tried to answer throughout the book. Yeah. 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 So why is it that when you start to pull on the thread of this missing grandfather, that this other story gets intertwined with it? What are the, what are the links between these two stories? You call them uh, kind of a braided narrative at one place in your book. Um, what is it that braids them together? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, what we learned about my grandfather was that not only had he been a member of the RIS commando, which, um, you know, at its largest point had hundreds of Latvian men in it, and it was a all Latvian unit. It was one of these kinds of local units to whom the Germans um, deputized to carry out, you know, a lot of the dirty work, so to speak, and thinking that it would be a kind of short-lived operation. Um, and so Boris, my grandfather, was he was fluent in German, and so he quickly became kind of the translator for the leading figure, Victor Zaris. Um, and there's a lot of lack of clarity about what his precise role was. But another man who was in this commando was also Zuckers. And so we have documentation saying that they were in the same place at the same time, that their names are on the same documents in one case, uh, in which there's a request for rifles for members of the commando. Uh, so they must have known each other. The evidence suggests that they would have crossed paths at a certain point. Um, and for that reason, I started following, you know, the rule of reporting is that when you can't find the hard thing, go look at the easy thing. And hopefully that will lead you to more sources of information. And the Zucker's case had been documented here and there. Uh, I had studied the Eichmann trial, and so I was really shocked to learn that there was another act to the kidnapping and trial of Eichmann in which the same Mossad agent who was organized all the logistics for the Eichmann kidnapping operation was then sent back to South America with a new target a few years later, and that target was Zuckers. And it seemed to me that in that case, there was so much richness and material and, and um, it was kind of a, you know, there's this moment in Arendt's uh, account of the Eichmann trial where she fantasizes about what would have happened if Mossad had not bothered to kidnap Eichmann and instead had just shot him on the streets of Buenos Aires. What, what kind of justice would that have produced? And to me, when I discovered the Zucker's case, I thought, here's our answer. Yeah, yeah. And it, it seems like the answer is it doesn't produce justice in the long run, um, but, um, but 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 maybe we'll get to that in a second. You yeah. you quote you also quote at one point Václav Havel, who talks about growing up in a and or, or living in a in a, a post Soviet satellite state that the lines of conflict don't only run between people but internal to people. Yeah. Um, and and it seems like that's particularly true of your story, where you have one side of the family that's that's Jewish and another side of the family that may have been involved in this killing commando. Um, and I'm wondering if in some ways um, you aren't representative for, um, in, in a way, symbolic of a conflict that's also running through Latvia right now, as there is a lot of political arguments about, uh, about, about memory, memory politics. Um, and, and, and with that in mind, I'm wondering, why is it that Kukuris has become a, a man of interest again? Um, so he was killed in 1965. The historical case against him seems pretty shut and dry. He was involved in mass killings. Um, he was known as the butcher or the hangman of, of Riga um, because um, unfortunately, um, this was one of the places where the Einsatzgruppen really developed their techniques of, of what some historians have called the Holocaust by bullets. Um, yeah. It was just just bloody, awful, horrible work. Um, why is has he become a person of interest in Latvia again? Well, what I saw was that, you know, he was a hero before uh, World War II. He was this kind of very well-known aviator. He His name was all over the papers. 
uh, his face was recognizable um, because of his aviation. You know, he was called the Latvian Lindbergh and um, he fancied himself to be a journalist and he was, you know, celebrated by independent Latvia at a time when the nation was in its first experience of independence, you know, its first flowering as a nation. And so the in a strange way, the fates of Zuckers and the fates of the Latvian nation became kind of perversely intertwined. And so the contemporary efforts to rehabilitate him are kind of like an, it's a exculpatory uh, excavation of this figure that not only has been so long tied to the Latvian national project, um, which has always threatened, of course, not only, you know, by the German takeover during World War II, but you know, also, you know, primarily by the Soviet takeover and the th ongoing threat of Russia at the border. And so all of these things are tied up in this desire to sanctify and protect the independent Latvia. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that I document in the book is how you have this profusion of cultural artifacts that you know, not only the novel in which my grandfather is framed as the person who killed Zuckers, uh, but also a musical. Uh, there have been films about him, you know, many kind of celebratory websites. There was a um, museum exhibit and even postage stamps. And, you know, you could write these things off as kind of a fringe effort to rehabilitate him, but they really did acquire much more cultural cachet. And I think what I tried to document in the book was how um, in an absence of kind of collective language with how to um, speak about the fact that the lines of conflict run between run between individuals as well as the collective, you do get these openings where rehabilitative projects can come about. And so for me, it's an indication that something is lacking in the public sphere. And that's what I was trying to write towards. Yeah, you just you um you just said really rehabilitative projects in the book you you call it revision re historical yeah. revisionism I think, um uh, both are applicable I think revisionism maybe gets at the political uh, at the political issues involved a little bit more you actually interview the uh, the author of this book um you cannot kill him or you cannot kill us you could almost say because it, it seems like when he's writing the book he's actually not talking about Sukhus only he's talking about Latvia as a country yeah. right. Yes, and he's very clear about that. I was, you know, and it's one of those moments where there's no subtext, right? Because the subtext is <laughs> just there in front of your face. Um, and, you know, I think it's so interesting because I spent many, many years, uh, you know, in close contact with the Latvian Jewish community that was and continues to do incredible work, not only to save what can be saved, of Jewish life in Latvia um, and who were kind of the primary actors in pushing back against this rehabilitationist narrative. Um, and they did it out of patriotism, mm -hmm. you know? That is so important to them. And I think that's, um, it became very clear to me that as they were claiming, you know, no, we have always been a part of this nation from the very beginning, from the very founding of Latvia. Um, and indeed, these kinds of uh, founding Latvian thinkers and poets um, looked to the Jewish community for a kind of guidance about how to nurture their own culture. And um, there were these moments of kind of beautiful flowering before everything kind of became destroyed and so many people were lost. Um, so I think, you know, in a kind of contested situation, you have all of these different narratives and I was trying to sort them out in a way. And it would be one thing, you know, it would be a strictly academic project if, if it hadn't been for the fact of this court case. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this book, I have to say it again, this book is an incredible read, and it does so many different things at the same time, and it's all woven together in such a such a compelling way. Two of the kind of the academic things that it does is it's, it's it performs literary criticism and also uh, the, the kind of the analysis of cultural memory. And I have two linked questions about those right now, because there's one point where you talk about how 
really, if you look at the fall of the Berlin Wall, if you look at the end of the Cold War, that memory politics goes through different stages in a place like Latvia. I'm assuming that this holds true for, for perhaps many former satellite states of the, of the Soviet Union, but certainly for Latvia, that in the 1990s, when Latvia is interested in joining the European Union, then Holocaust memory becomes a kind of a, a, a kind of an entry um, to show that you're willing to face your past shows that you're willing to be European. And there was a kind of a moment of commemorating the Holocaust at, at looking perhaps inward, or at least not fighting the possibility of, 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 of national or personal blame, but that as countries become um, more skeptical of the European project and kind of circle back to a kind of recidivistic nationalism, that resuscitating quote unquote heroes who might have had a very dirty past in the Holocaust is a part of that project. So at first you say, we have sinned. And then, you know, the, the, the nation might say, no, wait a minute, we want to protect some of our figures as symbols of ourselves. And that leads to the, the literary question, because th this author of You Cannot you cannot Kill Him, You Cannot Kill Us, um, he, he makes use of your grandfather in a very particular way. Okay, we know that Mossad actually killed Sukhoth, um, but he claims in this fiction that your grandfather was behind this kind of squad that didn't set out to kill him, but actually wanted to kidnap him for information. What's what's what <laughs> role is that that crazy story playing in this novel? Yeah, I mean, there are so many kind of dimensions to your question, and you know, I think this is one of the fascinating and really troubling things that's playing out right now is, as you said, you know, you had the quote unquote memory boom of the 80s and 90s that then manifested in prescription that certain kinds of memorials had to be built uh, throughout Eastern Europe, not explicitly as a condition of them joining the European Union, but, you know, it couldn't hurt. Um, and so there was this kind of sense that it was being imposed from away and that there weren't really kind of like homegrown or efforts at memorialization, although of course now there are and there um, since then there have been kind of really wonderful uh, domestic contributions and the first Latvian language translations of Jewish survivor memoirs have begun to occur because previously one of the issues is that they were all in the Russian language and young children in Latvia no longer learn Russian. So that was one of the issues. Um, and you're right that, you know, this story emerges as kind of like this moment of pushing back against this prescription of how memory should look and how it should be not only physically imposed upon the environment, but also kind of discussed in the collective. You know, and I think when you're speaking about the former Soviet states, there is so much, um, you know, perhaps all of our viewers will be familiar with the kind of myth of the double genocide that the, not only was the Holocaust perpetrated first on the territory of Eastern Europe before the, you know, architecture of the gas chambers was built, but also there were mass deportations by Soviet authorities uh, during World War II and prior to that similarly resulted in the deaths of um, thousands of people. And so these two kinds of tragedies are by some people seem to be competing in the public space for uh, attention. And indeed you can see in Latvia that the language of the memorials for the Soviet deportations and executions is very, very similar to the language that we see elsewhere. Uh, uh, that commemorates Jewish victims of the Holocaust. Um, and so you're operating in the same kind of terrain. And out of this, <laughs> there's a lot of opportunity to manipulate how these stories unfolded. And so my grandfather became this very convenient vessel um, upon whom to project all of this, right? Because he had, he was almost kind of like the worst kind of traitor, according to the author of this novel, that he had belonged to the RS commando. Therefore, he was a traitor in the fact that he worked for the Germans. And then he was a double traitor because he then joined the KGB. And there is some evidence to suggest that he, his job in the KGB was to identify those who had collaborated with the Germans. Um, 
But what was super disturbing to me about the book and the reason why I felt a need to actually respond to it and in like one of the early versions of this book project, I wanted it to be called You Will Never Kill Him as a kind of direct response. And then someone very rightly pointed out that it would pose issues for the translation. Um, but in this novel, not only is my grandfather kind of a traitor three times over, but he also um, is involved in the fabrication of Jewish testimonies um, that are used to suggest that Sukkur's did the crimes that we know he did commit. But it's kind of this, to me, it was this incredibly sinister attempt to take it even further by undermining the few things that we do have documenting how these crimes unfolded in Riga. And the fact, as you said earlier, that the prosecutor directed me towards this novel as a way to, to procure facts, it just kind of, it was this moment, it just sent a chill down my spine, you know? Um, so. Yeah, you, um, I think in, I think, um, uh, I think in the, in the book, you say that your grandfather in this narrative um, becomes the vessel for all that's unholy, because of course, Latvia can't be guilty and the Latvian, the Latvian Limburg as a symbol of Latvia can't be guilty. So you need, uh, you need a kind of a scapegoat, but there's a, not just your grandfather's being scapegoated, there's another level of scapegoating on, going on here because um, according to this fiction, um, mm -hmm. he leads the commando to find um, uh, Tsukas in, um, in South America because yeah. he knows where the quote unquote Jewish gold is buried. And so these old anti-Semitic tropes um, pop up again in this narrative, even while it pretends to be neutral on the question of, of um, and doesn't say that, you know, doesn't accuse your grandfather directly of being Jewish, but he indirectly knows where the Jewish gold is buried. And for that reason, he fakes all this testimony, um, which means that it never happened and whoever was in Latvia has to be innocent. Um, you said yeah. that the book was so anti-Semitic, so kind of dripping with that, that your mother could barely read it. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Could, exactly. could you talk a little bit about the resurgence of anti-Semitism? Or is it a resurgence? Did it ever go away? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I. that's the thing. It's so interesting because it was a, I relied a lot on my mother who, of course, you know, grew up um, in Soviet Latvia, uh, you know, as a Jewish child, you know, knowing she was Jewish, but not really knowing what that meant. And of course, um, because of the realities of Soviet life, not observing the Jewish holidays. Um, and, you know, so I felt horrible then kind of asking her to help me with this project and, um, you know, reading this horrible book together. Um, but it was kind of a fact-finding mission. Um, I think the question about anti-Semitism is so complicated because, you know, on the one hand, it really means a lot to me to honor and acknowledge everything that the Jewish community in Riga is doing to, you know, not only preserve and protect the legacy of what remains, but also to reclaim it, you know, they have achieved one of the largest restitution awards um, in the former Soviet Union for the return of confiscated Jewish property that was confiscated by the Soviets. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of important work being done there. Uh, but also, you know, you just cannot remove this history that was so easily exploitable um, for the purposes of the nation. You know, if you look at the registers of the men who signed up for the RIS commando, very few of them cite overt anti-Semitism or hatred of Jews as their reasoning. They say, I wanted food, I wanted a gun, I wanted revenge against the Soviets. And occasionally some of them do cite it, cite it overtly. Um, but you do get the sense that it's kind of lurking in the background there to be exploited. And I think one of the wonderful things that has happened over the last 20 years is that there has been a really concerted effort to have education about Jewish history um, and the dangers of anti-Semitism in Riga and to actually think very critically about how to put that in the curriculums, um, you know, because it's not as if 
it's not like in Germany where it's, you know, there is the kind of tried and true way of teaching this to students. Um, there it's all very, very new. Uh, and there's this very difficult question of what do you do with people like Zuckers, you know, in Ukraine, the same, you, you could have the same conversation about Stefan Bandera, who has had a similar uh, re-emergence as a national hero, despite the fact that he, uh, you know, was complicit in the killing of Jews. Um, and I think that, you know, this was why I started looking back into the much deeper history of Latvia as a center of Jewish civilization and um, as a place where a lot of these kind of foundational texts, you know, the place where we have a summer house in Bauska was originally called Boisk, you know, was one of the kind of great shtetl civilizations. Um, and also it's the place where Herder was kind of riding along on his horse collecting Latvian folk songs so that he could come up with the term nationalism and really understand that a nation was a place, you know, this romantic idea that a nation was a place with its own poetry and language. Um, and in that moment, in the late 19th century, you have uh, the Jewish community translating Latvian denas or poems into Yiddish and vice versa. So you have some kind of mingling, you know, and I became really invested in tracking that as a kind of antidote to not only thinking about this horrible and ongoing history of anti-Semitism, you know? Yeah. yeah, how interesting that sort of the the original theorist of nationalism got his start <laughs> there, right? Right, yes, and it makes sense, right? Because you have this place that's an emergent nation that, but at that time when he was there, hadn't yet claimed its own independence and was really working towards it. Um, and I think, you know, there have been, um, you know, there's a kind of square, a plaque that's dedicated to Herder in the center of Rico, which I think is a really beautiful place. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And of course, any, any place that has suffered so many different occupations and, you know, have, has been really a, a subject nation or even a vassal nation in various sort of empires and regimes that have moved through it, of course, allegiance, um, becomes a very, very conflicted issue. Um, yeah. And it's very, very difficult to, to purify um, and, and and probably need scapegoats or looks for scapegoats to do so. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing that I was trying to understand is, you know, in the legal system in Latvia um, and, indeed, you know, in other former Soviet states, there's a lot of holdovers from the Soviet system and, and, like, it was almost as if through this case of Zuckers, all of this was coming up, you know, you know, he was a petition for rehabilitation, which is itself a Soviet term um, that was used to excise and erase um, the victims of Soviet repression during the period of the thaw. And this category then after the fall of the Soviet Union was then used to rehabilitate those who had been seen to be complicit with the regime. Right. Um, and so you have all of these kinds of layers of the old regimes, which are preserved in the memory of the law itself. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, when, when you're rehabilitating somebody against the, you know, the, this, the Stalinist purge trials, you know, who, who you're rehabilitating against, but who, who is the, who is the antagonist, who is sitting in the other, in the other, um, in the other uh, chair in this trial. It's a, it's a, it's a very vexed question. Um, you mentioned a moment ago about how members of the, the Latvian Jewish community are fighting tooth and nail to preserve the truth to preserve memory um, in the name of justice, but also in the name of, of Latvia to, to not make the, the, the place um, an embarrassment. Um, you also mention a, a very important person that you come in contact with when you're collecting facts and testimony. And this is Edward Alpro, Alperovich Ed, or yeah. Edward Anders. Could you talk a little bit about who he is and your connection to him? Yeah, so I mean, one of the great joys of the book was you know, speaking with, I mean, Ilya Lensky um, is a kind of brilliant historian. He currently runs the Museum of the Jews in Latvia in Riga. And um, he, together with David Lipkin, who is um, the lawyer representing the Jewish community of Riga, 
basically in an attempt to combat this effort to rehabilitate sukkars went looking for every single living survivor who could still testify in person about uh, his crimes. And that was how they found Edward Anders, who was a child in Leopaya, um, whose mother taught him to lie and say that he um, was not Jewish. And so he was able to kind of live in the woods for a while and kind of barely escaped, but he still saw all of his neighbors being led to the beaches in Leopaya, which were where the executions were held. And um, it's a really uh, disturbing and kind of eerily beautiful place on the shore where the Soviets built this kind of uh, really large monument to all of those who were killed there. And it's the site where we have some of the only photographs of direct killing, um, aside from those that were taken at Babi Yar. Uh, so there are these, you know, just this kind of monumental event. And Nadine Fresco also wrote very movingly about this in her book called On the Death of Jews. Um, and Ander saw all of that. And he has was a cosmo chemist by profession, and he later in life applied his scientific expertise to finding out exactly what happened on those days, who survived and who the perpetrators were. And I met him in person because uh, he lived not far from me in Northern California. And he showed me, you know, all of his archives. You know, he had this formidable collection of postcards of old Riga because it was the site of his childhood. So he felt really attached to the place. Um, and also attached to the Jewish history, which had been, you know, so erased over the ensuing years. And he emerged as this, such an interesting figure because he collected testimonies of Jewish survivors for, while he was in Germany as a refugee. Uh, he kind of put himself to work, he and his mother. And indeed, he went to Nuremberg to tell the tribunal what he had seen. And it's this kind of heartbreaking moment if you read the testimony that he tells them that almost his entire community was wiped out. And then later the prosecutors say, we're sorry, you're too late. If only you had arrived a couple of days before we could admit your testimony. But because of the procedures of the trial, we cannot. And in this way, the knowledge that he was providing them was not kind of subject to the tribunal's metabolism in a way. And because he played this integral role in, in collecting the testimonies, he was really important to the Jewish community because they wanted him to say, look, this is how we collected them. They aren't fabricated. They were collected in the proper legal way. Um, and it's something that I think about all the time because when I, you know, and this is the moment that you referenced earlier, when I write that I felt I became an actor in the case, where the Jewish community asked me if I would ask Edward if he would be willing to testify yeah. um, in the Zucker's case. And he case. said no, right? Yeah, and he said no because he said, you know, it's a fool's errand and I've done this enough. I know how this is going to go. Mm. Um, there should be no such investigation. Um, and I have, you know, little time left in my life and this is not how I want to spend it. I've done enough work. And I, it's such a, you know, I respect him profoundly. And to me, that refusal to engage with the law and in doing so acknowledge what it was trying to do is such a powerful act of refusal. Yeah, yeah. And didn't he send you all of his files at some point just so yeah. you, could, you could be the keeper of them? Yeah, I mean, he's just an incredible man. And um as a writer and, you know, scholar, it's kind of this treasure trove when you realize you found the person at the center of the narrative who kind of gives you the keys, you know, and then I can, there was no one who he didn't correspond with and no one who didn't approach him, um, including the revisionists and the rehabilitators and as well as the Jewish scholars who are searching for information. And so, uh, and he himself, you know, he has this like 
because he was a chemist, he has this amazing scientific approach to it where he tries to calculate exactly how many perpetrators there must have been. Um, and, you know, we can ask, is that a worthwhile project? And what does that kind of tell us? Why do we want this kind of exactitude when we look to history? And in many ways, my book is asking that question is that after all of these years, why are we still applying these standards to this history instead of thinking about ways of looking at it critically and memorializing it in a way that it deserves? Yeah, yeah. So Anders is a, is a survivor and he's a witness. And then he becomes a, a, an astrochemist at the <laughs> University of Chicago. Um, and, but he's also a, a historian. Um, does, he publishes in, is it history and genocide studies or, in, or in, uh, history uh, or Holocaust and genocide studies or history and memory, one of those. And he becomes a really a kind of a sought after expert um, for, yeah. for this particular region. Um, and in the end, he says no to the court case. He's kind of a historian. A history instead of the historical struggle instead of the legal struggle. And in fact, many of your interlocutors um, think about the relation of history to the law, of law to literature. There are different ways that you put it in the book. Could you talk a little bit about the different kinds of evidence or the different roles that law and literature play? Why the law becomes so important now or why it might have been important um, at the time of the extrajudicial killing? Yeah. I mean, this is such a rich question. And I think I write in the book that, and it's true that I, when I started this project, I was operating quite naively about the, you know, I was very enchanted. I thought if you have a legal proceeding, surely there must be some truth that's uh, achieved as a result of it. And certainly justice also. Um. And I ultimately kind of came up against the limits of legal judgment and its relation to historical judgment. You know, the fact that, you know, there's this great line by um, Richard Evans that the law will not be interested or it cannot prove a thousand deaths when it can prove a hundred, you know, functionally, those are the same. And this is exactly what you see in Latvia, where we have evidence suggesting that the deaths were much greater by, you know, orders of 10 that are nevertheless excluded from law. And that's a kind of very basic thing that happens in the first order, right? When you have the trials ongoing close to the crime. And then the normal order is, of course, then the historians come in and they provide their own account of what happened. Um, that has a little bit more distance and can make some more complex conclusions about the facts behind these events. What I saw and what really animated me was that it was the historians' conclusions who were then being re-subjected to the log legal logic. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, many viewers might have heard of uh, the trials of mo very recently, only a few years ago, um, the trials of the Polish historians who you know, broke Polish law only by writing historical monographs about the complicity of Poles in the Holocaust, right? And so they were asked to say, how can you know this? And that poses like, an, like a profound epistemological problem for how we think about the past. If we cannot, okay, if the law doesn't want to think about this testimony because it wasn't collected in this very strict way, then the historians and the writers can at least look at it and take it on as, you know, for what it is and to take it seriously. And what I saw was that, you know, because when you have the Holocaust, the individuals who gave those testimonies often are no longer living and are no longer able or, you know, able to give their testimony in person. And the result of that is that their testimony is thrown away. Yeah. So all of a sudden the evidence kind of falls out and it's as if there's nothing left to stand on, even though we all know that's not the case. Um, and that was what I really wanted to kind of ring the alarm bell on because we're in this moment where we're struggling to think about how we're going to preserve and 
and honor Holocaust memory at a moment when we're losing the last living survivors. And I think at the very least, front of mind should be, how do we prevent their testimony from being undermined as repositories of fact? Yeah, yeah. This is kind of a more insidious version of that twilight zone between fact and fiction, right? I mean, you go through it in your own investigation, but what's happening in terms of the historical record, you know, you've just, you just put it, I think, very concisely that a lawyer will, will convict somebody for one murder rather than a thousand because it's easier to make that argument in court and it's easier to collect the evidence. But when later down the road, the conviction for one murder becomes proof, quote unquote, that a thousand murders weren't convicted. When this legal expedient is turned around to deny historical fact, then something has gone wrong, right? Something right. something terrible has gone wrong. And no longer is history a kind of a supplement to the gaps in the law. The law becomes a weapon to invalidate yeah. history. And one thing that I'm really interested in right now is the immense, like I think we are now in this very legalistic moment when I often get asked, and I think about a lot, you know, how would we achieve justice for the crimes being perpetrated in Ukraine right now? And a lot of people are rethinking, what do we do with the Nuremberg model? Is this model still viable? And there's this kind of reflexive turn to law as a place where we can secure justice, even though it's kind of undermining its own purpose in many ways. And so I'm really interested in kind of this historical rethinking that we kind of have to do right now. Yeah, yeah. You, I think you quote Reinhard Kosalek at one point saying, talking about how history takes place between, what is it, hope or expectation and, oh, no, I've forgotten the other term. Experience. Yes, experience. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That... Between looking toward the past and looking towards the future, right, and kind of mediating how we see the present in that way. Um, so, and, and I think the other important thing that I want to say is that, and the insidious bit of it is not just that it's undermining testimony and it's kind of taking out the ground from underneath us, but also that it defies conclusion, right? The Tsukras case is still ongoing. Yeah, It's been appealed many times. There's no verdict, um, or decision rather. And you see like this refusal to rule, this refusal to say, okay, now the time for adjudicating this is over. Now we need to let this memory play out elsewhere. That moment has not occurred yet. And that's, you know, I get asked about the subtitle of the book a lot. And that's really what I mean when we think about endings, right? How do we, how do we mark this supposed end? Because frankly, that's where we are in a way that, um, you know, doesn't allow for things to be taken from us. Yeah, yeah. In the, in the closing few minutes, um, the, um, the organizers have, uh, have uh, texted me that we won't be entertaining uh, questions from the audience today. So in the remaining few minutes that we have, I wanna um, take this back in a more personal uh, line of questioning because I think you are writing a kind of history here. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different form, but it's very much history. And you structure this book in a particular way, in a very artful way, and you end it by, me by, by mentioning that you've finally come across a photograph of your grandfather where he's wearing a Nazi uniform. I think that's the last sentence of the book. Um, why, do you, why do you end the narrative with this revelation? Well, I mean, frankly, because that came towards the end. Okay. Uh, and I... You know, this was such an exhausting undertaking emotionally and, you know, and intellectually as well. But I was so like, I I couldn't believe that I was, you know, dedicated. You know, I think there's you whenever you kind of probe the history of your perpetrator ancestors, you really have to justify it. And I felt so conflicted about this, even though I told myself, no, I'm intervening to prevent rehab rehabilitation and revisionism. But honestly, uh, my father sent me those images almost when I was like wrapping up the book. And it was one of those moments when I thought, how is this possible that, you know, clearly, you know, he hadn't wanted me to see them or, you know, something was going on. And I just thought this is a really 
complex moment, both for me personally and also for this history. And I thought, I, this is kind of the bookend for me, you know, yeah. and whenever you finish a project, you have to understand. And I've come to understand that it kind of lives a life beyond you and the kind of moral thicket that I found myself in um, definitely remains with me. And so I think I've just been kind of putting it in abeyance for now and um, letting myself live with the book for a little bit longer. Yeah. It seemed when I was reading it, it, it you know, that, that photograph might have come into your hands in a kind of a moment of awful serendipity, right, when you were finishing the book. But it seemed to me to model also what you were recommending, you know, by by ending with this. It's not an admission. I mean, you have nothing to admit, but by ending with this moment of recognition, as painful as it might be, you seem yeah. to be modeling what you hope this process in Latvia will end with, which is a recognition of complicity. Mm -hmm. So that you can then move on and not keep right. and not keep sort of adjudicating this case over and over and over again. It seemed yeah. to me to be one of the most wonderfully kind of honest and um, and and giving moments in this book. Actually, um, mm -hmm. I was very I was bowled over by that ending. Um, that's exactly the right place. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you thank for you. saying that. I I hope that's true. I mean, I hope. I think what I found. Um, is that there are so many facts that are known and that often we get caught up in seeking, you know, the details of what can never be known. You know, did Zuckers get out of the car in the killing field? Of course he did, right? Was he just picking flowers? Probably not. You know, it's this effort to have a forensic understanding of the past that makes us not understand the already profoundly disturbing and adequate things that we do know. And so for me, when I saw that picture, I thought, okay, I understand. I see, I know I have this evidence and we can kind of leave it there. Yeah, yeah. Linda, could you tell us in our last couple of minutes, if you have any new projects, what are you working <laughs> on now? Yeah, well, speaking of endings, um, I am working on a history of oblivion, um, which definitely came out of this book uh, because I was really interested in endings, in how people move on from one period to another. And indeed, in returning to Yosef Yaroshalmi's question that you quoted at the beginning, right? Um, what if the antonym of forgetting isn't memory? What if it's justice, right? And, and historically what I found was that there were ways of commanding oblivion. And it was while I was, I was speaking actually to a German historian of the Holocaust who told me, you know, we were speaking about these ongoing trials of perpetrators and how odd it was that they were, um, you know, continuing and that these investigations were playing their role. And he said, didn't you know that there used to be this term in every peace treaty called oblivion? And it meant that there could be no continuing um, lawsuits or tribunals uh, after the fact. That was, you know, it was a mechanism that was designed to delimit the scope of the damage, basically. Um, and meant that people couldn't speak about what had occurred in public. Right. So I'm really interested in that. And I've just been kind of following that thread into the present. Well, I hope we get to see the product <laughs> of your uh, following this thread very soon. Linda Kinsler, thank you for this generous book. And thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Um, and thank you to Miriam and everyone in Munich for having this conversation.